All right, guys, welcome back to the channel. We're glad to have you as always. Uh, keep sending us your prayer requests because we are writing them down. We are praying for you guys on Wednesdays. Even if you don't see it in the chat on Wednesdays, we're still, we've got them. You know, we're, we're praying for you guys. So thank you so much for letting us do that for you. All right, sermon time. Okay, this sermon is about denial. And I'm gonna call this the trial of denial. So when I say trial, I'm talking about trial as in the court of law. You see, when we get stuck in a cycle of just denial, okay, there's no improvement, there's no going forward, okay? It's not just a season, okay? It's an actual cycle. Denial is a, an invisible prison, okay? Denial is an invisible prison. This sermon is designed to help you recognize it, recognize the dangers of it, and how to overcome it. So remember this statement, okay? The devil is not only in the details, but he's also in the denial. Here's Brother Skulk reading Judges chapter number 16. Enjoy the sermon. God bless. Judges 16, starting in verse 1. Then went Samson to, Gaz to Gaza, and saw there an harlot, and went in unto her. And it was told the Gazites, saying, Samson has come hither, and they compassed him in, and laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city, and were quiet all the night, saying, In the morning... When it is day, we shall kill him. And Samson lay till midnight and arose at midnight and took the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts and went away with them, bar and all, and put them upon his shoulders and carried them up to the top of an hill that is before Hebron. And it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and said unto her, Entice him and see wherein his great strength lieth, and by what means we will prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him, and we will give thee every one of us eleven hundred pieces of silver. And Delilah said to Samson, Tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lieth, and wherewith thou mightest be bound to afflict thee. And Samson said unto her, If they bind me with seven green whiffs that were, that were never dried, then shall I be weak and be as another man. Then the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven green whiffs, with which had not been dried, and she bound him with them. Now there, now there were men lying in wait, abiding with her in the chamber. And she said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he brake the whiffs, as a thread toe is broken when it touches the fire, so his strength was not known. And Delilah said unto Samson, Behold, thou hast mocked me, and told me lies. Now tell me, I pray thee, Wherewith thou mightest be bound? And he said unto her, If they bind me fast with new ropes that never were occupied, then shall I be weak, and be as another man. Delilah therefore took new ropes, and bound him therewith, and said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And there were, and there were liars in wait abiding in the chamber, and he brake them from off his arms like a tread. And Delilah said unto Samson, Hitherto thou hast mocked me, and told me lies. Tell me wherewith thou mightest be bound. And he said, uh, and he said unto her, If thou weavest the seven locks of my head with the web. And she fastened it with the pen, and said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awaked out of his sleeps and went away with the pen of the beam and with the web. And she said unto him, How canst thou say I love thee, when thy heart is not with me? Thou hast mocked me these three times, and hast not told me wherein thy great strength lieth. And it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death, that he told her all his heart and said unto her, There hath not come a razor upon mine head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. And when Delilah saw that he had, that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up this once, for he hath showed me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up unto her, and brought money in their hand. And she made him sleep upon her knees, and she called for a man, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head, and she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. And she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he woke out of his sleeps, and said, I will go out as other times before, and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord departed from him. But the Philistines took him and put his eyes out, and put out his eyes, and brought him down to Gaza, 
and bound him with the fetters of brass, and he did grind in the prison house. Howbeit the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven, then the lords of the Philistines gathered them together for to offer a, a great sacrifice unto Dagon their god, and to rejoice for, for and to rejoice, for they said, Our God hath delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hand. And when the people saw him, they praised their God, for they said, Our God hath delivered into our hands our enemy, and the, and the destroyer of our country, which slew many of us. And it came to pass, when their hearts were merry, that they said, Call for Samson, that he may make that he may make us sport. And they called for Samson out of prison house, out of the prison house, and he made them sport. And they set him between the pillars. And Samson said unto the lad that held him by the hand, Suffer me that I may feel the pillars whereupon the house standeth, that I may lean upon them. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there, and they were upon the roof about three thousand men and women that beheld while Samson made sport. And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood, and on which, was, and on, and on which it was borne up, and on the one with his right hand, and on the other with his left. And Samson said, let me, die with these, let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might, and the house fell upon the lords, and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. Then his brethren and all the house of his father came down and took him, and brought him up, and buried him between Zorah and Eshtel, in the burying place of Manoah, his father, and he judged Israel 20 years. Brother Evan, you want to pray for us? All right. Amen. Judges chapter 16. If you would look at verse number four. So the Bible says, And it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. So, of course, we visited this several months ago, and we went through the book of Judges. And I wanted to come back and kind of revisit Samson a little bit. And in this verse here, we can see this is the third time that Samson has now just repeated this cycle. Okay, he's repeated the cycle of choosing unhealthy relationships with women. And so I'm going to title this The Trial of Denial. The Trial of Denial. So we're going to kind of break that down and I'm going to give you some thoughts on why I think that he is in this cycle of denial. Talk about all the problems with it and associated with being in denial. Now I want you to keep your place right here in Judges 16, but go to Ecclesiastes chapter number 3, if you would. So I look at denial, okay, living in a state of denial as an invisible prison. That's the way that I look at it. You know, I think back on certain times in my life where I've been in denial about certain truths. And I look back after breaking free from those things thinking, wow, you know, I really was binding myself. I really was trapping myself. I really was hindering my forward progress simply because I refused to acknowledge what was holding me back. And I think it's a very dangerous, dangerous thing. Now, I personally can't preach this without mentioning this guy here. Um, there's a, a guy, he's, he's dead now. His name's Admiral Rickover. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of him. Born in 1900, died in 1986. So he died when he was 86 years old. And he's uh, obviously a, a retired naval officer. And he's regarded as the father of the nuclear Navy. Um, <clears throat> uh, definitely a brilliant guy. Unfortunately, he was a Jew. Okay, but kind of a rebellious Jew. And he created this cult-like following in the Navy. And it kind of spread a little bit throughout various branches of service. And this guy was eventually forced to retire. Okay? And he was forced to retire because of that cult-like following, because he was kind of rebellious. You know, he didn't see the point in saluting people. He didn't see the point in wearing his hat or taking his hat off when he went inside buildings. There's just kind of little things like that, just kind of a, a rebel. But he's real famous for this quote. And this quote is something you've heard before. You've probably heard me say it. But he would always say, and this would always be drilled into us, especially when I went through the Navy, uh, the Navy nuclear program, was that the devil's in the details. Okay? And you know what? Anytime a Jew says that to you, they're not lying. <laughs> they're telling you the truth. The devil is in the details. And he came up with this system here. And I'll show you how this all applies in a minute. He came up with a system here, which now, of course, is being pushed against, you know, the, the bureaucrats and the, 
the DEI people, they don't like this, but let me just read these things off here. So he developed this system. It's seven rules for success. And he said, number one is to practice continuous improvement. Number two, hire smart people. Okay, you see why that's a problem today, okay? Because people don't wanna, you know, hire smart people. They wanna hire the right color and skin tone of people and be all diverse, okay? And number three, establish quality supervision. Number four, respect the dangers that you face. Number five, training must be constant and rigorous. And number six, audit, control, and inspect. And number seven, learn from past mistakes. Okay, you can't learn from past mistakes. You can't implement any of these seven steps if you're in any form of denial. And so when I went through the Navy's nuclear program, they were just really, they would hammer these things into us. You know, you, can, you have to own up to your mistakes. You cannot hide from them. You cannot be in denial because people's lives are at stake, especially in that type of a job. And he's famous for this quote here. It says, if you're going to sin, sin against God, not the bureaucracy. God will forgive you, but the bureaucracy will not. And, he, and he's right in that. You know, <laughs> He's definitely right. I don't like the way that's phrased or worded, but I get the point. You know, God is forgiving, but a uh, man definitely is not. And so I'm going to make a statement that kind of piggybacks off of his. And I'm going to say the devil's not only in the details, but also in the denial. Okay. The devil's not also in the details, but uh, I'm sorry, the devil's not only in the details, but also in the denial. And I believe that that is why Samson had such a tragic life was because of denial. Denial is something that the enemy would love for all of us to be involved in. Why? Because it is a prison. We understand that the devil does not want us free from any type of prison. And we've already talked about this a couple of months ago. Yeah, the devil can't possess you, but he can definitely possess space next to you. And of course, we definitely don't want that. And so the devil is in the details, but also in the denial. Now you're in Ecclesiastes chapter number three. Uh, look down at verse number one. So the Bible says this, to everything, there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. We've mentioned this before several times. Okay, we get that. There's seasons. Seasons change according to the time God has established them. But what do you call it when a season doesn't change? Okay, what do you call it when you get stuck in this pattern that does not change with time? That is called a cycle. Okay, so we can see by this verse here that seasons change with time, but cycles can only change and break with us. Okay, and in order to do that, we have to be aware of denial. Okay, we have to become and make sure that we remain a people that is all about truth. Go to Jeremiah chapter number six, and you can leave your place there in Ecclesiastes. We're not going to come back to that. Okay. So the enemy uses denial to make us get caught into cycles that eliminate seasons. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter number six. So if you look down at verse number 14, and of course, Jeremiah the prophet, um, definitely not very well liked by a lot of his own people in the southern kingdom of Judah because he's preaching God's word. He's telling people, hey, guess what? It's just too late. Hey, okay? we've done too much against God. The Babylonians are coming and we better just get in line with that program because there's no stopping it. And of course, people didn't like that. And what people were doing is basically saying, hey, don't listen to Jeremiah, okay? God loves us. God's gonna take care of us. God's gonna defeat the Babylonians. And oh, by the way, we can still worship our false gods and you know, go behind closed doors and display all this you know, wickedness and all of this demonic imagery in the temple and all, all, all these horrible things, okay? And so they were in denial by and large, during Jeremiah's day. And because of that, I want you to look at verse number 14. And so the prophet here, repeating obviously what God had told him, says this, they, this is they, the children of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah, they have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly. Okay. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, peace peace when there is no peace, okay? So what you have to understand this about this verse is that when we're faced with a situation that is going to be very difficult for us, okay? 
the flesh wants to run. Okay, you ever heard of this fight or flight syndrome? A lot of times we pick the flight. Okay, when we're faced with a ugly reality, okay, your flesh, your old man is going to want to deny it. And why is that? Because the flesh seeks instant comfort every single time. Your flesh, my flesh wants comfort. And so because of that, and because we lack so much discipline today, when we're faced with these struggles and these trials, it's very tempting for us to just write that off and just in the moment say, no, that's not going to happen. I don't think so. I don't believe that. I don't believe the Babylonians are coming and it's going to be fine. And so that does produce a slight healing in the moment, but it brings on detrimental trouble later on because we're pushing off the reality. We're pushing off what is eventually imminent and going to come and do us damage. And so what I would say here is that denial is damage. Okay, that's one of the definitions of denial. It's damage. Denial is declaring something that is um, true, not true. Okay, and so we want to make sure that we develop ourselves into a people that are strong enough to be able to resist this temptation by saying, no, no, no. I know a tsunami is coming and we're like right on the beach, but it's going to go over. It's going to be totally fine. You know, there's just nothing wrong. It's going to be, it's going to be cool. And the, you know, no need to make preparations and things like that. You might feel comfortable in the intern, but it's going to be just tragic for you later on. Go to James chapter number five. And of course, we're not going to come back to Jeremiah. So go to James chapter number five. So denial is damage, number one. Number two, denial makes it impossible for us to change, okay? If you're stuck in some sort of a pattern, some sort of a cycle with something, whatever it is, okay? You keep telling yourself, well, you know, maybe, maybe this will come to pass, but it doesn't, okay? Remember, seasons always change. And our church goes through seasons. It goes through seasons where we get a lot of threats and then we don't. And, you know, people are happy with us. People are not happy with us. You know, these are seasons. These are, these are things that, that, that happen and they change with time, okay? But if we were to get stuck into some sort of a, a holding pattern of just constant turmoil and upheaval, you know, the only way that we would be able to get out of something like that is by acknowledgement, by actually saying, hey, look, what is it that we're doing wrong here? What is it that we need to change? What is it that we actually need to take ownership of and reconcile so that we can move forward? That's the only way that we can break a cycle. So denial makes it impossible for us to change. Okay. And number three, Denial is when we live like we're blind, but we have the ability to see. And everybody in here, you have the Holy Ghost, okay? You have those eyes inside of your head. You have the ability on your own to see truth, to look at the Word of God, and to say, this is the standard. This is what I go with, despite what anybody else says. So, for example, when I was going through the uh, Navy's nuclear program, I'll just, just make a quick example, okay? Let's say... I'm going into a reactor, and this is the nuclear reactor. And this is going to be very basic. But let's say, okay, here's the standard. This cup has to be right here, one inch from the left side, your right side of this pulpit, and the handle here has to be facing east, okay? So what they're going to do is they're going to make you look at that. They're going to talk about that. They're going to give you the reasons why that is. And they're going to make sure that you can write it down without memory, okay? And they're also going to give you the manual, which states all of those specs, Okay. And then they're going to do mock-ups and they're going to make you walk through here with a checklist. Okay. Is it one inch? Is the handle facing east? Yeah. Good to go. Okay. And you're going to mark all of those things off. Okay. They're training you to recognize details and then they're going to test you and they're going to do this. Okay. And you're going to have to walk in there and be like, huh? Okay. Well, it wasn't like the training I had. Something's not right here. Okay. And then you're going to have somebody next to you and this is what they do to you. They'll say, well, it's still facing east. What's your problem? Okay, what's your problem? It's still facing east. You're going to mark that as a defect. You're going to waste taxpayers' money. You're going to waste time. You're going to waste my time to have to now go and stop this evolution. You're going to cost the government money. And then they pressure you like that. Okay, but they're like, look, it's still fate. That's still east. Okay, but it's really not, though, is it? Okay, it's not due east. And I'm just for an illustration. This is east. So it's more like a, a northeast. Okay, so now you have to be able to go back to the spec, go back to the manual, and look up the definition of east. Okay, it's going to do east, cannot be, you know, any degree off whatsoever. And so, you know, you'd be like, okay, I'm going to mark this as a defect. And then finally, the instructor just keeps quiet, and you have to go on through the rest of the room and find the other Where's Waldo type things. 
And then when you're done, they're like, hey, good job. That was right. That was a defect. But that's how they mess with you, you know? And I've liked to take that type of training into my own life. And that's how I like to approach situations. And that's how I want you guys to approach situations as well. What this says is what we go with, okay? And we can never be a people that is in denial just because of the Delilahs in the world. We're going to get to that here in a minute. Let me just say this also. Denial is the deliberate act of closing our eyes to truth that may hurt our feelings now, but save us trouble later on. Okay? And last but not least, denial causes us to not deal with something now that will deal with us later. Okay? Denial is destructive. It's damaging. It is absolutely horrible. Now, let me just kind of give you a little bit of application here. James chapter number five, look at verse 16. So the Bible says this, confess your faults one to another. Now, notice it doesn't say go into a box with a priest or some guy with his collar on backwards, okay? No, confess your faults one to another. And pray one for another that ye may be healed. Why? What's the point? Well, look at this. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Okay? Now, the enemy knows that we can't improve what we will not acknowledge. So the temptation for us and the smokescreen from the devil is for you to ignore this. Okay? But the way that we get out of this is we find somebody that we can trust and talk with and say, hey, I've got this problem. What do you think? And we confess our faults one to another, okay? Not to a priest, not to just a pastor. Okay? But you find somebody that you can confide in and get things right. Talk about it. Bring the stuff out in the open. What does that do? That helps you to acknowledge the struggles that you're facing, okay? And once you do that, then you can make forward progress. Then you can advance. It's such a simple thing to say, but it's very difficult to actually implement in your life, okay? Because who do you trust today? I was in a church a long, long time ago. This was like in the early 2000s. I think Caden might have just been born, and the pastor was reading this, and some guy just pops up. I don't know if Jessica remembers this. This guy just pops up, and he's like, I'm struggling with weed. I'm struggling with this stuff in front of the whole church. It's like nobody even really knows who this guy is, you know? And people are like, oh, that's great, brother, you know? And it's just like, oh, get me out of here. What is going on? It's not what he's talking about, you know? You know, this is embarrassing, you know? Confess your faults one to another. Let me just go to Walmart and just scream at the top of my lungs. Hey, I'm struggling with this and that. No, man, okay? Choose this confider very carefully, okay? Very, very carefully, but I just wanted to bring this up because this is a important key for us to get better, to improve, to actually make that forward progress that is so necessary and uh, to learn from our past mistakes. So go to Judges chapter number 14. All right, Judges chapter number 14. And let me just kind of show you a picture of this, okay? So we're talking about this. The enemy knows that you cannot improve what you will not acknowledge. And I think that's the whole point here and what God wants us to see between Judges 14 and Judges chapter 16. And coincidentally here, both of these passages we're going to look at, Judges 14, 1 through 4, Judges 16, 1 through 4, okay? So there's something to this here. So let's start this off. Look at verse number 1. So Judges 14, verse number one says this, Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. And verse number two, and he came up and told his father and his mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me to wife. And then his father and his mother said unto him, is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren or among all thy people or all my people that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said unto his father, get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. Okay, so his parents are giving him some righteous advice here. Like, hey, you know, you don't want to be unequally yoked here, dude. Like, just isn't there, there's got to be someone here for you. And he's like, get her for me. I got to have her. We got to go to Tim now. She's great. She's the one for me. Okay. But look what verse four says. But his father and his mother knew not that it was of the Lord that he sought an occasion, okay, that God sought an occasion against the Philistines. For at that time, the Philistines had dominion over Israel. So here's the deal. Okay. Samson here has a desire that is not good, okay? And you're going to see how this turns into denial in just a second. But it's not saying that God 
put this unhealthy desire on Samson, okay? But what this is telling us here is that God is working with Samson and his lust in the flesh, and God's still going to use that to deliver the nation. So God's like, okay, well, there's my boy. I gave him all this strength. He's just, it, it is what it is, but I'm still going to work with that. I'm still going to use that, okay? So he's like, hey, I got to go get this woman and, and God's looking to start an occasion with the Philistines. And it winds up happening, and we've read these stories before, and Samson does get a great victory, but what winds up happening? Okay? Well, this woman's father gives her to somebody else. Okay? And he comes back and he's like, okay, well, my wife. And he's like, oh, I never thought you were coming back, dude. So I just wrote you off as a son-in-law. Okay? Now, if he would have gotten a wife from his own people, obviously God's laws and statutes hopefully would have prevented, definitely would have prevented something like this. Okay? It would have been a different outcome. But nonetheless, God did still use that to start the process of delivering the children of Israel. But notice the unhealthy desire here for this woman. Okay? Now go to chapter number 16 and look at verse number one. So many battles take place between uh, uh, that point and now. And look at verse number one. So it says, Then went Samson to Gaza and saw there an harlot and went in unto her. Now, obviously, Judah did the same thing. This is not healthy, not good. Okay, He's got an issue here. Okay, he's got a problem with women. Why is he attracted to this? Why, why is he going down this road? Well, part of it's the flesh, okay? Part of it's obviously the flesh. But the bigger issue here, which you're going to see in just a couple of verses, is that he has a problem with denial. His parents had tried to tell him, hey, you know, there's a better woman for you. You know, there, you can do better than going down to the Philistines, going to the oppressor to take of their people. You can do better. Didn't listen, didn't want to do it. Here, what's he doing? Going unhealthy relationship, okay? A transactional thing that's this unclean, not good. Hey, no acknowledgement though. He just keeps on going. Look at verse two. And it was told the Gazites saying, Samson has come hither. And they compassed him in and laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city and were quiet all the night, saying, In the morning when it is day, we shall kill him. And Samson lay till midnight and arose at midnight and took the, dock, or, I'm sorry, took the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts and went away with them, bar and all, and put them upon his shoulders and carried them up to the top of a hill that is before Hebron. And so, you know, we've got this guy. He's got an unhealthy desire for these women. He's unchecked. He's going rogue here, but he's still strong. He still has power from God. And so if you were to see this during this time, you would look at Samson and be like, wow, you know, maybe what he's doing there just really isn't that bad because God's still blessing him, okay? But we don't know the full story yet, do we? If you were back in Samson's day, you wouldn't understand that God's like, hey, you're about to get taken advantage of here very seriously, and you're going to lose everything. You're going to lose all of your strength because of your denial and your um, inability to acknowledge that you need help, and you got to get back on track. Look at verse 4. And it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman. This is the third time here, third unhealthy situation with a woman. And it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the Valley of Sorak, whose name was Delilah. Okay. Now we're going to come back to that here in a little bit to that verse, but skip down for sake of time to verse number 28. Okay. And so we can see that Samson's stuck in a cycle here. Okay. He ain't getting out. This isn't a season. You know, the woman at Tinnath wasn't a season that he went through where he's just like, okay, right now I like this type of chick. Okay. That wasn't it. Okay, he then went to a prostitute, now back to the Philistines. Okay, he is stuck in this unhealthy cycle, loses his strength, loses everything. But when does he get it back? When does he finally break free? Well, it's right before he dies. Look at verse 28. And Samson called unto the Lord. There you have it. Samson called unto the Lord. This is that acknowledgement. This is that confession that I'm talking about. He realizes, I am here, I am rock bottom, and the only way out is up. And so he finally looks up and realizes, oh, that's the key. That's the ticket. I'm way down here. I've been brought as low as I can go. I'm, I went from being able to carry the gate of a city to being made a spectacle in front of the world. And now I get it. Now I have to call to the Lord to get help. And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me. I pray thee and strengthen me. I pray thee only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. 
And so we can see when was he able to finally break free of that cycle. It's sad, but it was at the end of his life. And of course, God grants him this permission and he gets the victory and kills more Philistines than he did his entire life. And we get to read about this thousands of years later and he's in the hall of faith. So again, I would almost say, you know, obviously you don't want to wait until this type of situation happens to you, to us, but... You know, the point is, I mean, God's mercy is there for a reason. You know, the Bible's clear that he's going to be merciful to our unrighteousnesses. And if we acknowledge, okay, these struggles that we have, guess what? He is going to help us overcome that and get that denial away from it. But that's the thing. You have to be strong enough for you to admit that you're in a cycle of some sort of trouble and you need help and you got to get out. And you do that through confession, okay? Because the enemy knows you cannot improve what you will not acknowledge. So, 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. I'm going to have you look down at verse number 31. There's another little tip. I like this one here. Paul says, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Okay. Again, what is that? That's adding on to what I've already been saying. Confession. Remember, the enemy knows that you cannot improve what you will not acknowledge. Okay. That's why he throws up these smoke screens to get us confused and to get us in this state of denial because then we can't go forward. We can't improve. Okay. And so what Paul's point here is that self-correction limits God's correction. So when we say, all right, I'm jacked up here, here, and here. And you're like, you know what? I've got to break free from this. You go find somebody to talk with them, to help you get through this, okay? That acknowledgement is going to help you break that cycle. And of course, through the process of time, you're going to arrive in a new season of life. Go to Romans chapter number seven. Let's talk about this. So self-correction limits God's correction. God would much rather us see the issues in ourselves and for us to say, you know what, I got to take responsibility here for my own actions of what I'm doing, than to be like, okay, you're not going to listen. Well, now I'm going to have to take this. I'm going to have to do this to you to kind of get you back in the right place. Okay. So I can't say all of that and not give you something else here that we struggle with. Okay. And let me just show you this. So Romans chapter seven, look at verse number 22. I'm about to show you the biggest problem that we have And I want you to understand that this is a daily problem. Look at verse 22. So Paul says this, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. That is after the saved man. That is the new man that's inside of you. The new man always, always delights in the law of God. Okay, but look at this. Verse 23, But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity, to the law of sin, which is in my members, okay? And so denial can really flourish in our lives when we neglect the reality of our duality, okay? You have to understand that there, we have this duality. We have a twin, okay? Sometimes I say we're kind of bipolar. That's not really a good way to put it, but we have a twin. Every single one of you are saved. If you're born again, you have a twin, okay? This is why sometimes we can be super nice and everything's good. Oh, I'm in the spirit. And the next thing you want to cut someone's head off, you're angry, you're flipping out, okay? We're strong one minute. We're straight the other minute. We're honest one minute. We're deceiving the next, you know, The reason why we're like that is because of the reality of our duality. And Paul's acknowledging that here, verse 22, saying, hey, guess what? You know, in my inward man, I delight in the law of God. I want to read the Bible. I want to go to church. I want to go soul winning. I want to edify the brethren. But there's this other dude, okay? And that's what he means here. But I see another law in my members, my flesh, in my body. That's what he means there. Warring against the law of my mind. So I've got the mind of Christ. I've got the Holy Spirit. Okay, I've got that inward man. That inward man's crying out to God on a daily basis for truth, to be united with him. But Paul's like, this other guy, man, he just doesn't like that program. And so I find myself getting brought into this prison, or he, he says captivity, to the law of sin, which is in my members. Okay? And so with that, also understand that this duality, it impacts not only who we are and how we appear to other people, but also it impacts what we want, our desires, okay? We spend more time in the old man, we spend more time in the flesh, then we're going to desire the things of the world and the problems that come along with that, that are associated with that. 
But when we say, you know what, I'm going to exercise some discipline here. I'm going to squash this down. You know, guess what? Your desires are going to change and you're going to be brought back to wanting to, to be more in line with God. It's just, it's, again, it's a simple concept to understand, but it's hard to do. And the reason why it's hard to do is because the flesh is strong. The desires of the flesh are no joke. And this is why I tell you guys, you know, when you run into people and they're just, you know, trying to put on this facade, like I've got it all together and I don't struggle that much and I overcame that. It's like, that's cool. We all have things that we've overcome. But don't ever get so obsessed with somebody that you think that that person doesn't have issues because we all do. We all got the same flesh. If they got a pulse, they've got this problem. It is what it is. Look at verse 24. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? So again, Paul here speaking by the Holy Ghost, like, how is this going to go away? Well, depending on what church you go to, they're going to say, well, once you get saved, the Holy Ghost gets rid of it for you. And he forces, he basically forces you to clean up your life and do good and you don't struggle with sin anymore. Wrong. That's wrong. That ain't true whatsoever. Okay. The answer is found in the very next verse. 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And so another way of putting that, and what he means by that is that once the flesh dies and goes into the ground, that's when it's over. That's when you will only be basically in line with the things of the Bible, what the new man wants, because you won't have that twin anymore. That twin, we get to drop him off. We get to, we get to get rid of him and get a new body that's in line with the new man. But it only happens after we die. So again, we don't want to deny this to ourselves. And we want, because here's the thing, you start denying this. You're going to start thinking, man, there's something wrong with me. I'm not as good as this person. I'm not as good as that person. I might as well give up altogether. I might as well just throw in the towel. Okay. No, understand that Paul's telling you, the apostle Paul, the guy responsible for like two thirds of the New Testament is telling you, I've got beef. I've struggled. And I not only have I struggled, but I continue to struggle. I've got problems too. Okay. Very edifying when you think about it like that. And I go back to Judges chapter number 16. So knowing that, you know, obviously I believe that Samson was saved, you know, hundred percent. I believe he was saved. He wouldn't be mentioned in the hall of faith if, if, if he wasn't. And so, you know, you look at the life of Samson and you can kind of see this in these chapters. You know, I like the woman of Timnath. I like, you know, these, these other women here, but it's killing me, you know? And then what does he do? He just doesn't acknowledge it. Ah, it'll be okay. I'm so, I can carry a city town. I can beat a thousand people with the jawbone of an S, you know, who can stop me? Nobody's going to be able to stop me. I'm Samson. God's on my side. Well, unfortunately at the end, I learned that that wasn't the case. Time had ran out and then that cycle basically ended his life. So I told you we're going to revisit this. We're getting close to being done here. I just want to point something else out here with verse four and why, um, Samson was attracted to Delilah. So verse four, it says this. And it came to pass afterward that, now notice this, that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. Notice what it says there. He loved this woman. This wasn't just a let me go visit a harlot type thing, or she looks really good down in Tim now to get her for me to wife. No, this is an actual love that he has for this woman. Look at verse five. And the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and said unto her, Entice him, and see wherein his great strength lieth. And by what means we may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him, and we will give the every one of us 1,100 pieces of silver. Okay, verse 6. And Delilah said to Samson, Tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lieth, and wherewith thou mightest be bound to afflict thee. So verse four is very clear. Samson loves Delilah, but nowhere in this passage does it say that she loved him back. That's the problem. Okay. Delilah here is a picture, a picture of anything, a picture of a person or maybe even a place that might fill the needs that we have. Okay. But is wrong. Hey, does that make sense? Like Delilah, I mean, it doesn't say all the conversations they have. It doesn't say exactly how he fell in love with her. Okay. But the point is she, diff she didn't return that love. As soon as some other dudes came to her and was like, Hey, we got this money for you. She was like, cool. I can get rid of this guy. You know, no problem. I want the money. I'll take the cash. She didn't love him. If she did, she would have told him to get lost. Okay. So Delilah pictures the world. It pictures a person or place where the right needs get met, but it's in the wrong place, wrong situation. And what's tempting about Delilah here? 
Okay. Well, I mean, if you think about it, she obviously didn't dismiss his desires. We know he's got desires. It tells you that in verse one. That's why he went to the prostitute. He's got desires. So I would assume here, and this is my opinion, that she probably didn't dismiss those desires. She obviously didn't have a problem with his past. So we could say she didn't dismiss his past or his differences. The fact that he was a Hebrew and they're all Philistines, she didn't seem to mind that. So when you combine these two, what does that equal? That equals a love a one-sided love. He loves her, she don't love him back, and that equals this denial. And that's what cost him his strength. That's what cost him his life. Denial is destruction. If you don't remember anything else I say, denial is in destruction. The devil is in the details, okay? But he's not only in the details, he's also in the denial. So when you see this happening with brothers and sisters, you have to understand that the enemy is at work here, and we have to be able to stop it. Last verse I want you to turn to this morning is 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. So you'll bring all this stuff up. Romans 7, we've got this daily battle here. If I could just leave you with one single tool, it would be right here in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. Look all the way over in verse number 31. So Paul says this, I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And look at these last three words, too easy, too easy. What does he say? I die daily. Well, that's the answer. That's what you have to understand, you know? And by the way, this is another slap in the face to all these repent of your sins guys, or these guys that are like, well, holy sanctification. If you're really, if you've really given your life to Christ, then you're, it doesn't matter. You don't have to worry about sin. He's going to get that out for you. And clean, it's, it's an automatic thing. He washes your hands of it. It all goes away. Okay. Well, then why did Paul say, I have to die daily? Why did Paul say, hey, after the inward man, I delight in the law of God, but I see another member. I see this other guy, and he's got some interesting things to look at. There's this Delilah over here, okay, and she's offering these services offering this type of relationship. And I like that. Doesn't judge me. Doesn't look down on me. Doesn't put me in this uncomfortable situation where I have to acknowledge that I have faults. I like that. It feels safe. It feels comfortable. It's a healing. But is it really healing? No. What, it hap what happened? It cost him his life. It cost him everything. He could have had such a better life had he just acknowledged this problem that he had. If he would have just realize he's in denial. So die daily defeats denial. Okay. Denial is a cold blooded killer is what it is. So we're going to stop right there in the morning and we will bow our heads and have a word of prayer. So again, thank you so much, Lord, for this church, for all that you do for us. I just pray you bless the fellowship after the service. Of course, the soul winning today and bring us back again safely this evening. In Jesus name, I pray. Amen.